Happy Sunday, everyone. It is good to see you all. It's so great to have so many guests and visitors with us. Welcome. Um, when I was speaking with Rabbi Silverman, one of the discussions we had is whether he should come on a weekday and give a lecture like we sometimes do, or should he join us during the worship time? And so we kind of went back and forth, and so we thought we would invite him during the worship service. At the sermon time, we'll have a conversational sermon, and I'm just really looking forward to that. I want to thank you uh, for being with us today, Rabbi. Just a few announcements before we begin. We continue our Bible study on Tuesday uh, in Kinsale at 2.30 p.m. We are continuing our study of Acts 2 for uh, this week. Um, in the back of the bulletin, you, you'll see that there are a few things there also. Um, there is, this Thursday is our campus-wide memorial service, which we now have twice a year. We just had one in the spring, and now we'll have one this Thursday at, two, at 3 p.m. here in Mirfield, and we will honor all those who have passed in the last six months. And then next Sunday, uh, right here, we will also, during our worship service, we will remember our brother in Christ, George Barlow, who recently passed. And so please join us that day. Uh, George's family will also be here. Marilyn will be here, his wife. And so we just ask you to join us on that day. And also today is, it's not there, but in the liturgical year, many churches are celebrating Reformation Sunday. In a special way, we remember the Reformation. We remember our Protestant sisters and brothers in a very special way. And uh, we just pray for the continuation of the one day when we'll all come together, right? And so uh, we just, wanna, just wanted to highlight that and just to keep that in our hearts today in a special way. Are there any other announcements before we continue? Any other announcements? Let us worship God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of the scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and, his, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its seasons, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. Please join me in the, in the prayer. Most astounding God, you lead us through deserts and grant us safe crossings. When we lose our way, you pull us back to you and overwhelm us with love. All honor and glory are yous. We are asked this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn is number 252, Barak Hashim Adonai. And Carol is going to play, th play it through once because it's unfamiliar. But the words are especially meaningful. So read the words as you sing them.
Please join me in our, in our prayer of confession. Lord God, only you are holy, yet we imagine that we are righteous, excusing our own faults while pointing out those of others. Forgive us, O oh God, wash us clean, that we may serve you with joy and thanksgiving. Amen. Let's pause for a moment of silent prayer. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Let us share with each other the peace of Christ. What shall we pray for today? For peace. Yes. What's her name? For Pat. Yes. For Sue, who's in uh, in Alderwood in healthcare. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. What's her name? Peg. 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 Who had a, who just had a stroke? Let us pray. Loving God, we begin as we begin all things by giving you thanks and praise. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. And we thank you especially for your son, Jesus Christ. For the sake of all that is needed by earth, its people and our churches. For people of faith in every land, in every religion and in every home. For the church of Christ for world leaders, peacekeepers, diplomats, and government workers, for trees and plants, creatures large and small, for pets and working animals, for oceans, winds, and soil, for farmers in this harvest time, for those who fish and hunt, for those who ship and store what is gathered, and for those who cook and serve, for children in school, teachers and parents, and for those who have no schools, for all that, that we have not named, but by which you know, Lord, we trust that you will hear our prayer. <clears throat> Lord, I lift up everyone here to you. You know what's on their hearts. You know their pains and their joys, their sorrows, Lord. Bless them. Bless their family and friends. We pray for all our sisters and brothers in Friendship Village. In a special way, we pray for our friends in Alderwood and Waterford and Rowan House. We pray for all the associates, and we thank you for the work that they do. Continue to bless them and their family and friends, Lord. Lord, we pray for the church around the world. We ask you to protect them in a special way particularly in areas where there is war and suffering and pain. 
We remember our Christian sisters and brothers who died last week, Lord, in the war in Israel. We pray that their memories will be a blessing, and we pray for their family and friends. Lord, very specifically, we pray for all those who suffered in the hurricane in Acapulco in Mexico. Be with them in a very special way. We pray for all those who died in the shooting in Lewistown, Maine, Lord. We ask you to be with their family members. We ask you to be with that entire town and city in a very special way. We pray for all our Protestant Christian sisters and brothers, Lord, on this day. We ask you to forgive us for the sins of division. And we ask you, Lord, to just continue to guide us as we work toward making your kingdom a reality around the world. And bless them, Lord, and bless us. Lord, we pray for Rabbi Howard Silverman. We thank you for him, his ministry, his life. We ask you to bless him. We lift up also Beth Messiah Congregation, and we ask you to be with them in a special way, Lord. Lord, we pray for our sister Sue, who is in the health center. We ask you to send her a spirit of healing and encouragement. We pray for Pat, Lord, who's now in the hospital. No doubt she's overwhelmed and scared. We ask you, Lord, to be with her in a special way and send her a spirit of healing and encouragement and bless her family. We pray for Peg, Lord. Be with her during this time. Give her strength in body and mind and spirit, Lord. And Lord, we lift up all that we pray for peace on earth. We pray for the Israelis who uh, suffered great loss and tragedy. We pray for the families who were impacted by the deaths. We pray for that for those who have died, that their memories would be a blessing. We pray for our innocent Palestinian sisters and brothers who too have died and are in the crossfire of decisions made beyond their control. Lord, we just ask you to bring peace on that land, the land of Christ, Lord. So, Father, we lift up these prayers to you and the prayers that we keep silent in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment is in the law is the greatest? He said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David, he said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David, David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer 
nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn is number 81, Comfort, Comfort, Ye My People. Rabbi, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, I got it. I've never been good with technology. Press the button. Green light. All right, I think we're good. I think we're good. All right. Yeah, excellent, excellent. <laughs> so the rabbi just told me he's from New York. He's right. from Albany, and I'm from New York City. Right, neighbors. So that makes you an honorary Puerto Rican, huh? That's and it makes me an honorary Jew, maybe, That's from it. New York that, City. We'll take you. It's Amen. Good. That's, That's a great right. beginning. Well, Rabbi, we're all, we want to hear your thoughts about what's happening in the world in terms of um, the Israelis and the Palestinians and your thoughts. But before we begin, I was wondering if you can share a little bit about your own story, your own spiritual journey, and if you can explain to us kind of messianic Judaism. I know that's a whole semester. But. No, that's okay. I, I really, first, let me just say thank you 
uh, for the opportunity uh, to come. What, what a blessing, you know, it is, really, uh, especially these days, uh, to talk about these important issues and to frame uh, these things from the perspective of a Messiah follower, a Christ follower, of a, a, a Christian. You know, uh, there's a lot of uh, conflicting feelings and thoughts oftentimes with these things. So thank you for, for that. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, again, my name is Howard Silverman. I am the uh, rabbi at Beth Messiah Congregation uh, in Columbus. We're at the other end of town uh, near the corner of Morse and Hamilton uh, Road. Uh, and we are a Messianic Jewish congregation. What does that mean? That means uh, that we are a congregation of Jewish and non-Jewish people, people from lots of different backgrounds, that come together and worship uh, in a Jewish uh, cultural uh, way. That means uh, that our services are on Shabbat, on Saturday, on, on, on the, the same day, that, on the seventh day, you know. Uh, we call Jesus Yeshua, Yeshua, uh, the Messiah. Uh, when you come to our service, you would say, well, there's something Jewish going on here. You know, by the, by the songs that we sing, some things are in Hebrew, some things are in English, and, uh, and, um, and also we have a, uh, you know, a Torah scroll, you know, the five books of Moses in a scroll, and we, we read from that, and we sing songs, and, and uh, some of them are in Hebrew, some in English. We use some traditional Jewish liturgy and, and, uh, and things of, of that nature and so on. Uh, and, uh, and so that's kind of, of who we are. And uh, I myself, of course, um, came to know uh, the Messiah way back in the 1970s, uh, during that period of time when uh, uh, there was really a, quite a revival uh, of young people coming to believe, and, and many uh, uh, Jewish young people actually came to accept Jesus as the uh, Messiah. Uh, and, uh, and so I grew up in a traditional Jewish home, not the most religious, not the most orthodox, but kind of in the middle, kind of in the middle. I, a kosher home, I had a bar mitzvah when I was 13 years old, that's sort of the Jewish uh, age of accountability, we might say, when, when a Jewish uh, a young person, for boys, a bar mitzvah, for girls, a bat mitzvah, um, uh, participates in the service and and so on and I did all of those uh, did all of those things and and I um, had a very strong Jewish identity but when I was in college I was challenged uh, by the claims of Jesus and God knew exactly how I needed to hear that if someone just you know someone wearing a big cross uh, handed me a gospel tract I probably would not have paid attention. But I was going with a girl <laughs> who was a Jewish girl. And one day she said to me, Howard, did you ever hear of Jewish people that believe in Jesus? And I thought for a minute and I said, you know, that is the most disgusting thing I ever heard in my life. Why would a Jewish person want to, get, want to give up a heritage, culture, and tradition uh, to worship uh, the God of the Gentiles? I mean, we already believe in God. What do I need Jesus for? Yeah, you, you know, and uh, so that didn't go over very well. I, and I told her where the nearest behavioral health uh, facility <laughs> was, somewhere near Poughkeepsie, New York. All right, yeah. And, uh, I, and uh, so then I went home and I thought to myself, as um, many uh, young men probably would think, why ruin a nice relationship over religion? So uh, I called her back, and she just kept telling me about Jesus, right? And she introduced me to, um, to a man who was a, another Jewish believer who led uh, Bible studies in his home and elsewhere in, you know, in, in the area where we lived. Uh, and so to make a long story short, um, I really was wrestling with all of this and, and, uh, and came to, to faith. Uh, and, but from the beginning... I, I never uh, lost the sense of being Jewish. Um, when we talk about becoming a Christian, sometimes we use the word convert, you know, I like converted. Um, but we don't call it, uh, we don't even use that word, actually, because of, it has a lot of baggage 
associated with it. Uh, because, it because as a Jewish person, or whatever your ethnic identity is, you never stop being that person, right? Uh, uh, and so as a Jewish person, it was really coming to know the Jewish Messiah, not uh, really a, a changing a belief system uh, per se, if you know what I mean, uh, but coming to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel, embracing the Messiah of Israel, and enhancing my Jewish identity, and in, the, in a way, as the scriptures would teach, returning to God, not in a sense finding God, but returning to the calling that he had called our people to. Uh, and, uh, and that was a long time ago. Uh, and since that time, I have been involved in um, Jewish outreach uh, ministry uh, for many years. And uh, since 1991, I've been the spiritual leader uh, here at Beth Messiah of the Congregation. Since when? 1991. 91. I'm an old man. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, when, uh, when this massacre first occurred a few weeks ago, yes. and then the beginnings of the war as it's evolving now, um, I thought it was important um, to bring someone to give a perspective. And then I, um, and then I found you, yes. and I thought, you know, what a unique perspective for someone who's Jewish, who's Christian, who can kind of who can speak from give it a unique optic and perspective, and the conversation could maybe touch on the three Abrahamic traditions in yeah. in some way. Um, and I just lost my train of thought. Wait a minute, give me a second. Um, when I was putting the title of this talk together, I named it. I landed on Israelis and Palestinians, a Messianic Jewish perspective. But initially, I thought Israel and Palestine, a Messianic Jewish perspective. And then I thought, it's really hard to separate the land from the peoples. Right. And so I'm just wondering if you can just, I don't know, just share some thoughts about the history, the peoples there, just as a way to begin the conversation. OK. So uh, you'll inter you interrupt me when uh, you when <laughs> okay because what I'll do is uh, start uh, from the uh, scriptures and then kind of bring us to where we're at today okay so <clears throat> we know in the Bible that uh, God's desire for redemption right. Uh, you, you know that uh, we know that uh, you know Adam and Eve are rebelled in the garden, and uh, we know that uh, God uh, uh, there was the, then began a slippery slope of sin, right? And uh, God looked at the earth and was sorry that He had made mankind, and He was ready to forget the whole thing, uh, but He found Noah, right? Then there's the flood. Uh, after the flood, what we learn is that well. The heart of man really hasn't changed. God says once again, the intentions of, he says the same thing before and after. The intention of man's heart is, you know, evil in every, every way and so on. But then he says, but I'm not going to destroy the earth again, right? And then uh, uh, we come to Abraham. And basically, uh, with Abraham, God is saying, I'm going to bring redemption now, not, not by uh, destruction and starting over, but through humanity. I'm going to uh, bring redemption through humanity. And so we read in uh, Genesis uh, chapter uh, 12, God calls uh, Abram from where he had been living. And, and just these are real places on earth, right? So first, uh, if we read the text very carefully... He was living in uh, where it would be today uh, Iraq, right? Okay, near the Euphrates River. And his father moved their family before this time to southern Syria, to a place called Haran. And while they're in Haran, they were on their way actually to Canaan. But if you look at a map, you can't go directly or safely at all directly from uh, Ur, of the Chalde Ur of the Chaldeans to Canaan because it's a desert, right? 
uh, today, clearly, you know, uh, it's the same as it was then. It's a desert. So you would follow waterways to get wherever you wanted to go, right? So uh, they were in Haran, and they were going to enter a Canaan. And God says to Abram, he calls him. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting. The text doesn't say why. It doesn't say, you know, it just Abram is, is there. And, and God calls him. He says, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, and later on it will say, and you and your descendants. And just to save time. I, all the families of the earth uh, will be blessed. Right? So God calls him to go to uh, the, this land, the land of Canaan, which later is Israel, uh, you know, the land of Judah and uh, the land of, you know, the northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah and all of that, right? Uh, and, and he says, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So through Abraham and his descendants, redemption is going to come to the world. And really, the rest of the Bible is the unfolding of how all of that takes place, right? Uh, now, a little later on in uh, the 15th chapter of uh, uh, Genesis, we read here that how God, so to speak, uh, enters into in the world of that day, like sighting on the dotted line, enters into like a covenantal a uh, uh, relationship. It had been a promise. Now he's going to like sign a covenant with, with Abraham, an unconditional uh, a covenant where God will bring this to pass, right? Uh, and so in the 15th chapter, uh, it says, uh, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward will be very great. Now, Abraham is very nervous here because he doesn't have a descendant. He's getting old, he doesn't have a son, and he doesn't know what's going to happen, right? So uh, he says, uh, Lord God, will you, what, will, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Uh, since you have given me no son, I, uh, one who has been born in my house is my heir. And, and then God says to him, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. That's going to be Isaac, clearly. Isaac. Uh, and, uh, and God uh, takes him outside, and he looks at the stars of the sky, and he says, this is, this is, you're going to have descendants like you can't believe, right? Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord. You know this verse, <laughs> Right? Uh, and he credited to him as righteousness. Okay, so now farther on down, uh, we see here uh, God, uh, uh, you know, tells him uh, uh, kind of what's going to happen in the future. But God now says, in, in a way, God condescends to Abraham's human uh, understanding of how a promise or covenant is made. And because God wants him to know that this is really going to happen. So uh, he says here, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these and cut them in two and laid, and laid half opposite the other, and he did not cut the birds. Okay? All right. I, and so this was a way in ancient times of making a covenant. And then the two parties would walk in between, in between them, uh, and, and so on. Now, but it says here, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. Then God said, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, okay, for 400 years. Uh, I'll judge the nation whom they'll serve, and afterwards they'll come with many possessions. And then he says that, that, you know, then you'll return. But then we read in here in chapter 15 and verse 17. Now it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark. My Bible sticks together here. One second. Okay. Whoops. 
I'm sorry, there we go. Okay, and behold, a smoking oven and a flaming torch appeared, which passed between the pieces, a representation of the presence of God. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I, will, I have given this land to the river of Egypt as far as the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Cadmonite, the Hittite, Perizzite, Rephaim, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. Okay, and, and so here God has made now this covenant, right? And it would take too much time to go through all of the passages where God reiterates this to Isaac and to Jacob and the 12 sons of Jacob and, and so on, and says to each of them, and in you and your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But we know how, how, this, uh, how this plays out. We know uh, that uh, the Jewish people go into slavery in Egypt. Uh, we know they're there for 400 years. Uh, they come out of Egypt. They're in the desert. Uh, and we know that you know, they're, they're obedient. They're disobedient. Uh, they enter the land. Uh, uh, and we know uh, from the book of Judges and Samuel and Kings uh, that, uh, uh, that the, the people are obedient, they're disobedient. It's not some, uh, you, you know, uh, they didn't come down from Mars into this world, uh, you know, and, and be there. But, but God raised up uh, this people to be the channel of blessing to the nations, right? Uh, and we see that God makes a promise to David, Right? Uh, that through his descendants, right, w- one would come who would be the, uh, you know, the, the king of, is the ultimate king of Israel and the king over all the earth, right? And this one would be the Messiah. This one would bring peace. This one would uh, be the, the, uh, the way for the nations to come and, and to know uh, the God of Israel, Right? So when we come all the way, now we're going to go all the way to the New Testament, okay? When we come to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, and then we're going to quickly get to get past this, but we have to understand this uh, as Christians. If I was talking to simply a secular audience, I could just talk about the last hundred years of history, but it doesn't work that way for us. So in the Gospel of Luke, in the first chapter, where the angel is talking to Mary and explains to Mary, who she's going to give birth to, uh, we read these words. In verse uh, 29 of uh, Luke uh, uh, chapter 1. All right. She was very perplexed at this statement and was pondering what kind of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. What does that say? We'll give the throne of his father David. Okay. David was the king of Israel. When I say Israel, I'm not talking about a, um, a word in a hymn. Uh, a something on a doctrinal statement, uh, but the Jewish people, the king of the Jewish people, okay? King David and Solomon and then all those other kings who didn't measure up, right? So Jesus is the king of the Jews, right? The king of Israel. Whether the Jewish people recognize him or not, he, the Jewish people, we could say, are in rebellion to the king, you know, and and uh, and uh, but he's still the king of of this called people. Now, when I say called people, I'm not talking about individual eternal destiny. I'm talking about a calling in this world that that God has given uh, Israel. Okay, it says, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And when he says the house of Jacob, he's, again, he's being very clear that he's talking about the, the Jewish people, right? And his kingdom will have no end. All right. So, we, so when, we, when we sing, for example, uh, I was going to point to, the, to this hymn, but now I lost my place. Uh, Baruch Hashem Adonai. 
Baruch Hashem Adonai are Hebrew words, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord is what that means. And when you look at the words in that hymn, it talks, it, it's saying, I am a stranger and I've been brought in, right? And so we know from the scriptures clearly that uh, in the Gospels, clearly, Jesus is in Israel. He's talking to Jewish people. Uh, and, uh, and there's a remnant of Jewish people. The apostles are Jews. Uh, they, they recognize their calling to be witnesses to the nations, uh, the remnant of, uh, of Israel. And then later on, uh, of course, you'll take care of Acts 2 this week. But, uh, but if we run over to uh, the book of Romans, very quickly, uh, in Romans chapter uh, uh, 9, Paul says something really amazing here, okay? He says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse, separated from Christ for the sake of my countrymen, my kinsmen according to the flesh, Jewish people, okay? Who are Israelites, not, past, not, not who used to be Israelites before they rejected Jesus. It doesn't, doesn't say that, okay? Who are Israelites, to whom, present tense, belongs the adoption as sons and daughters. The glory, the covenants, the covenants, the giving of the Torah, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promises, whose are the fathers, speaking of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And from whom is the Messiah, according to the flesh, who is overall God blessed forever. Amen. So it, would this mean that Paul doesn't really care about the Thessalonians, that he doesn't care about the Romans, or that he doesn't care about the Colossians, or that he doesn't care about the Philippians? No, he cares about them deeply. But, he ha but there is something very special about the people he's related to. See? Now, a little farther down in chapter 11, he says, has God... God has not rejected his people, has he? He's talking about the Jewish people here. Far be it, you know, far, be, far from it. I, too, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected the people whom he foreknew. And then he goes on to talk about Elijah, and he goes on to say that there's a remnant. There used to be a remnant then. There's a remnant now. The remnant are the, these Jewish Messiah followers. And by adoption or being grafted in, all who embrace Jesus as the, 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 the Messiah are grafted into these covenants. You don't become Jewish, but into the, the, the covenants. Okay, I needed to say all of that to say that Jewish history and Jewish messianic history does not end at the end of the New Testament, okay? We could say, when you go back and you look at, oh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we could call all of that messianic history. Uh, yeah, I use the word messianic. That's sort of a, a Jewish way of saying Christian, right? A like Christian Jewish history. The coming of the Messiah, right? Well, we know that Messiah is coming again right? And as I like to say, he's not going to dot the I at Ohio Stadium on a Shabbat afternoon, okay? That he's going to be in Eretz Yisrael. He's going to return to Israel in the context of Jewish history. God continued, even in unbelief, unbelief, to have his hand on the Jewish people through history, through those horrible times of persecution for 2,000 years. And God, in his providence, kept this people united in their understanding of themselves, even though Jewish people were living all over Europe, basically, right? And some were living, some were in Israel, but many were all over, right? Now, so... When you come into the 300s, 400s, 500s, 600s, and, and beyond, uh, you still have Jewish people. Yes, there was still a remnant of Jews who believed, and some lived in the land. But, you know, a lot of people lived in the land. Romans lived in the land. Christians lived in the land. Jews lived in the land with Christians. Then you had is the rise of Islam, 
right? And, and so uh, uh, Muslims lived in the land, and Christians didn't like that Muslims lived in the land, and so Christians decided we're going to have a holy war, and we're going to rid the holy land of Muslims and everybody else, including Jews, and along the way <laughs> to the, the holy land of Israel. Uh, and, and so you have all of that. There's a lot of dark history involved in, in all of this, right? And then history continues on, and uh, you have now, you have Arab people, you have Jewish people, you have Christian people mingling in this land, living in this land. Uh, over time, it became ruled for hundreds of years by the Turks, by the Ottoman Empire, right? You had Jews, you had Arabs, you had Christians living in this land. Now we're going to scroll even a little quickly, right, uh, to the 19th century. In the 19th century, you still had Christians, you had Arabs, and you had Jews living in this land. So you had more Arabs than Jews, more Christians than Arabs, more Jews. You, just, you had all of these people living in the land. Okay. Uh, the Jews who were living in the land uh, were understood, in, in Jewish history, it's called the Yeshuv. Yeshuv means people who dwell somewhere. So you had, you had, these, you had these communities. You had, um, they're, they're called Moshav, Moshav, like farming communities. You had these communities in the land, okay? You had Arabs living in the land. By and large, the Arabs and the Jews were, were pretty much getting together. Not always. Skirmishes, you know, there were skirmishes here and there. Okay. Now, meanwhile, in Europe, Jews were being persecuted mercilessly. Okay. Uh, did you ever see Fiddle Around the Roof? Right? Fiddle Around the Roof. Right? And you know how the Cossacks come in and they pillage, they pillage the town and then they decide they have to leave. Right? Well, that was happening all over Europe. All over Europe. Uh, and so the Jewish people were coming to recognize, first of all, we can't stay here. Right, and so you have this massive move of Jews to the United States, Ellis Island, right? Maybe you come from either maybe Italian or Irish backgrounds or other backgrounds. In uh, all of our our relatives, all came through one door, right? Ellis Island uh, to New York City, and uh, it was kind of like the promised land uh, there a little bit, right? But for Jewish people, you had Jews who decided we're not going to go to America. We're going to go to the land. Now, it was called Palestine, but it was not a country. It was like just like a territory owned by the Ottoman Turks. It was, it was not a country, okay? And everybody who lived there, if they had passports, it said Palestinian on their passports. Jews, Arabs, Christians, anybody who lived there they had the name Palestinian on their, on their passports. Okay, as the Jews began to come into the land in the late 19th century and early 20th century, they had a vision, and it was called Zionism. Zionism. Zionism was the belief that the only place where Jews are going to really be safe in the world is in the land that God gave us thousands of years ago and that we used to live in for thousands of years, and that there are still Jewish communities there. Okay. So you, you had this influx of, of Jews. Now let's go to World War, the end of World War I. The end of World War I, now the, the land, this territory called Palestine was in the possession of Great Britain, right? Of Great Britain. And so they believed, the, the British believed that there should be somehow a, you know, a, a permanent nationhood uh, of, of Jews and Arabs, okay? But they couldn't figure out how to do it. And what was happening, that many Jewish people, when they came to the land, purchased land from Arab landowners uh, because the land wasn't, it wasn't prosperous. It was really a rocky nothing, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and, and so Jews began to live there, and they created more of these farming communities and so on, and there was more of them. And so now there was problems between Arabs and Jews, 
human. Sadly, when people don't know the Lord, that's what's going to happen, right? Uh, and so you had all kinds of activity going on. You had, you had Jews fighting against the British. Uh, you had Arabs fighting against the Jews, Jews fighting against the Arabs, Arabs fighting against the British, the British coming down on everybody, and it was really quite a mess. And so finally, the British decide, we are leaving. <laughs> and so you, newly formed United Nations, we're leaving this to you to decide what to do. In 1947, the United Nations came up with a plan. It was called the Partition Plan. And a slice of it would be called Israel, and a couple of other slices of it would come together and be called Palestine. Okay? But still, everybody who lived there was on their passport was called Palestinian until the day the British left. The British left in the morning of May 14, 1948. In the afternoon of May 14, 1948, the Jews accepted, the Jewish people accepted the United Nations partition plan. They will take it. The, the leaders of the Arab peoples did not accept it. They did not want it. And just go read the history. They did not want it because they did not want an Israel in, in the land. Okay? Uh, and so they did not accept it. The Jews accepted it. When, they, when the British left, the Jews just basically said, we're declaring our little piece of that a nation. Medinat Israel, the state of Israel. Okay, a few hours later, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt all uh, declared war against this fledgling state without it really a standing army. An amazing thing happened. The Jewish people won the war, won the war. They gained territory in winning the war that they did not start, okay? Now, the, uh, the leaders of the Arab people said to them, now listen, many of you who are living in the middle of this land, move out of the way, get out of the way. Doesn't that sound a little familiar even today, right? Get out of the way. This was the Arab leaders, them, get out of the way. Many of the uh, Arab people went to Egypt, Egypt owned a piece of land called Gaza. It was in Egypt, okay? Other uh, Arab people went to Jordan. Where did they go in Jordan? They went to a place called the West Bank. In Jordan, but it was in Jordan. It wasn't, okay? Very important to, to get, all right? Uh, so then there's this war. The idea was is that the Jews would be gone and so, every, so we have this whole piece of land, but it didn't work out that way. Okay, so now we have, Jew, we have uh, Arab people living in Gaza and the West Bank and in the land and in Israel, and in Israel, Arab Israelis, okay? All right. Now, 20 years later, now there's, maybe you remember it, the Six-Day War, right? The Six-Day War. When, again, every nation, uh, uh, all of the surrounding nations came against Israel. In six days, which is miraculous, Israel is victorious. This time, they gain more land. What land do they gain? They gain from Egypt, Gaza, and from Jordan, the West Bank. Now, Israel has this land, and I will say, from 1967 to today, Israel has not quite figured out what to do with it. And that is part of the problem, right? Uh, and, uh, and I will say that Israel has the heart of Israel, the heart of Jews, comes from this book. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And Israel, from 1967 to today, is how, do, how can we do this with the leadership of the Arab people who are now, now self-identifying as Palestinians? How do, how do we make peace? Because they don't want us in the land. Okay, this is just how it is, okay? Uh, and, and so, uh, to this day, 
If you remember Yasser Arafat and the Palestine Liberation Organization, they, they did not recognize the existence of the state of Israel. And now, Yasser Arafat came very close under, it was, I think it was with, under Jimmy Carter, when Jimmy Carter was president. Came very, this close, but at the end, you know, would not sign on the dotted line, right? And so you have the leadership of the Palestinian people not recognizing the existence of Israel. Okay, this is hard to have peace with when your neighbors don't recognize that you exist or have any legitimacy, see? Okay, so eventually the Palestine Authority You've heard of that, the PA, Palestine Authority, sort of son of PLO, you know, has come to the place of recognizing, recognizing that, okay? But in Gaza, that's never happened. Now, in 2005, the Israelis completely exited Gaza because the heart of Israel is that let these people be a nation, you know, you do have some hardliners on the far... We know have from that in the United States. You have some far, you know, like people that would say, no, this is the land that God gave us and we're not... But most Israelis don't think... Most Israelis just want, can we be at peace? You, you know? Uh, and, and most Palestinian people, can we just relax and be at peace? But, again, the leaders have not acknowledge the existence of the state of Israel. So in 2005, you might call it an experiment, maybe. The Israelis left Gaza, and there were settlements in Gaza, Jewish settlements, and it was, they had a, the Jewish, the IDF, the Jewish Defense Forces, had to go in and dismantle Jewish settlements and pull Jews out, some of them forcefully, okay? Okay, now let's see, what will Gaza do? Well, what happened in Gaza? What happened in Gaza? Hamas happened in Gaza. Hamas, you know, in Hebrew, Hamas means violence. I know that's not, it's, you know, it's actually an acronym uh, in, in Arabic, but it's kind of poetically dark, <laughs> I don't, you know. Uh, and, and, and so... Hamas, in their charter, does not recognize the state of Israel, but beyond that, what their goal is, is the extermination of Jews everywhere. Okay, so this is not just kumbaya, can we, you know, this, this is what Hamas wants. I'm not saying every Palestinian person wants that. Most Palestinian people just want to be left alone, right? But this is their leadership. This, this, this is the leadership. Okay, and so that brings us to now, right? This brings us to October the 7th, or even before October the 7th. Why is there a wall? Why is there a wall there? The reason that there is a wall in between Gaza and the, the you know, Israel proper is because of terrorism, is because of how do we, how do we maintain Peace, it, it, otherwise it's out of control, okay? Uh, and, and so on October the 7th, you know what happened. This horrific massacre of, of, of people being murdered in their beds and burned alive. Uh, not, are, not people in any military, just people living there. In fact... One of the reasons that Jews are living there is because the thought was, until that day, it's safer than living, it's safer than living near Jerusalem, where the West Bank is. It's actually safer. That sure, they fire some rockets in, they land in the middle of nowhere. Okay, we, we can live with that if that's what they want to do, you know. But we know what, what happened. Okay, now, now we see how did Israel respond, right? Is Israel and Gaza. And we see in our television terrible things. These are terrible things, right? This is a war. This is a war. Wars are terrible things.
things, terrible, terrible. Innocent people die in wars. Lives are ruined forever in wars, right? And Hamas, what do they do? They fire those rockets from hospital parking lots, from mosques, from schools. They, they live and do all of their work right among uh, all of the, the, the people showing great disregard for their own people. And I will tell you that the heart, the soul of Israel is broken because it is gut-wrenching for Israelis to do this. This is not, Israelis are not rejoicing in the streets over terrible things happening in Gaza. I wish I could say the, the other way around it was the same, but it's not. We have seen great rejoicing of, of people over the massacre of Jews. We've, we've seen it. And what is amazing is, so, so, is, so for Israel's goal, Israel's desire is to get rid of Hamas, not Palestinian people. If you hear that, that is, not, that is just not true. It is just not true. Uh, that is not, the, the goal is Hamas. And in the mind of Israel, it's better ultimately for everybody if this terror organization is not there. Let them have, you know, do their government. Let them have, have peace. And, and, and it's actually a lovely area along the coast, you know, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, and so, but now an amazing thing is happening all around the world that I, I never thought I would ever see in my 60, almost 67 years of life, I never thought I would see. And that is anti-Jewish protests around the United States, where at a college called Cooper Union in New York City, Jews had to hide in a library because people were coming after them, banging on the doors. That is unspeakable, okay? Okay. So, and I will say that when you see protests that say free Palestine, those are not protests to, to live with Jews, to have a, like a, oh, a two-state solution. There is, a, there is a phrase, there is a slogan, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. That means from the Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea. That means no Jews. That is exactly... <laughs> what Hamas certainly wants and what the Palestinian Authority would certainly desire, <laughs> you know? Uh, but the Jews do want to live in peace but can't figure out how to, how, to, how to accomplish that. And so now it's a war. Now innocent people are going to die. Innocent people are going to still die in Israel. People, people are dying in Gaza. It is absolutely catastrophic. Now, let me just say this and then I'll be quiet. You can ask questions or whatever. In all of this, where is God in all of this, right? First of all, God has always had his providential hand on the Jewish people, that they would not assimilate and be, you know, be extinguished from, from the world. Uh, he even says they would come back to the land in unbelief. It says that in Ezekiel chapter 36, that Jews would return to the land. In, first, they would return, and then the Messiah would, would come for them, They're, or we would say, as Christians, the return of, of, of the Messiah would, would come. And so Israel is in the land, but Israel is still, you might say, in a way, still an exile, certainly a spiritual exile, and in a way, a physical exile, in that you have Medina, Israel, you have the, the state of Israel. The state is supporting the people. The most, it's, what's important is the people, like, you know what you're saying? The people in the land. That is providential. And I would suggest, how is it that three years after the, the uh, almost genocide of Jews, by the way, you know, the word genocide was uh, invented to describe the Holocaust. I don't know if you're uh, aware of that. It's where the word comes from, Okay. Uh, and, 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 and so amazingly, in 1948, you have a state of Israel. Amazingly, a state that does not have a standing army defeats standing armies all, all around them. 20 years later, in six days, 
amazingly, or could we say miraculously, God has his hand on these people. And to this day, God has his hand on these people. Does that mean that they're right in everything they do? No, it does not mean they're right in everything that they do. Uh, and what we, what we really desire is the Prince of Peace. Who's going to bring peace? The Prince of Peace. The Messiah is going to bring peace. The, uh, uh, you know, the Palestinian people, they need the Messiah. The Israelis, they need the Messiah. They all need the Messiah. He is the one who brings peace, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and you, you know, there's a passage in Matthew chapter 13, uh, uh, Luke 13, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read the beginning of this, and then I'm going to tell you a quick little anecdotal story, and I'll be done. Okay. Uh, because I'm sure the train's off the track, so we don't quite know where it's going. Okay. So in Luke 13, it says, Now on this very occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. In other words, uh, uh, the uh, Yeshua, or Jesus, is hearing from people about Jews who died in a religious persecution. And, he said, and, and they're asking him, what about that? What about that? Okay, and it says, and Jesus responded and said to them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? He was a Galilean, by the way, right? So he's talking about Jews. He's talking about people like himself in this world, not the incarnate son of God, but in this world, Galileans, right? Uh, because they suffered this fate? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you think that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell, we could call that a natural disaster, uh, and killed, were worse offenders than all the other people who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is a great passage to say that when we hear of horrific things happening, how should we respond? We need to repent. We need to draw close to God. We need to see it all as a wake-up call to all of us. You know, that uh, not to get swallowed up in politics, not to get swallowed up in polemical arguments about this, and that, but to say, Lord, you know, I... I it's a way, I would just, like for me, a wake-up call. God loves a broken and contrite heart. We should all have a broken and contrite heart over what's happening, but it should draw us closer to God to be strong in the Lord so that we can stay above the fray, right? We may be Americans and we may come from different ethnic groups, but if we know the Lord, we are children of God, right? But we still have a human identity, right? So we don't deny that. Just like Paul in Romans 9, when he says, I'd give up my own salvation if Jewish people would believe, right? We, don't, we, we, we still have those identities. I, and, and so, but, but as believers, we have to frame them in the right way. So I think that, that uh, as believers, we need to respond first with re repentance and, and brokenness uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, and, and, and getting close to God. Uh, but also, I think we need to have a heart for, for, uh, for people. But understand what's going on. That understand that Israel is not an apartheid nation. Israel is not a colonialist, okay? Israel is not practicing any kind of genocide. Israel is not doing any of those things. And, uh, and I would suggest that, that what is happening is... The Bible talks about a spirit of Antichrist. And the fact is, is that God still has his hand on these people. And the fact is, is that when Jesus returns, he's not going to stop being Jewish. <laughs> okay? Uh, and it's going to be in the land of uh, Israel. Uh, and I would say that Israel has not helped the situation, certainly, you know, in decisions that Israel makes. But Israel is, I will tell you, I know Israelis. My son is in a tank right now at the Gaza border 
right where those destroyed kibbutzim were. That's where he is at this very moment. Okay? And he, what, did he, what was he doing on October 6th? He is, uh, was a, a founder and part of an, an initiative called Shrinking the Conflict. And what he, what he was doing was involved in making life better on local issues, not the huge issues of whose land is it, but local issues of Palestinian and Jewish, you know, local issues to make life better for Palestinians so that it's better for Israel if life is better for Palestinians. But now he's in a tank. Why? Because Israel recognizes that this can't happen. This is, a, this is like the war of 1948 all over again. It's like the war of independence all over again to be a free, a free people. And again, it is gut-wrenching for the Israelis what's going on in, in Gaza. But they are traumatized by this event. This is, the, this is the greatest destruction of Jewish people since the Holocaust. And in that manner, it wasn't arm, it wasn't, you know, it will... It was just people coming in and murdering and maiming and raping and taking hostages. We don't hear about uh, in these protests. Uh, and children, little children. This morning, I spoke to our, our kids. I teach uh, Hebrew school, we call it. It's like children, uh, seven, eight-year-olds. And I was trying to explain this to them. I said, you know, kids your age, without their moms and dads. Are, are being held as prisoners. And, and to Hamas, by the way, they are, they're not hostages. They are prisoners of war. Little children. There's something immoral and unnatural <laughs> about all of that. Okay, so finally, many years ago, in 1988, when Israel was uh, celebrating its 40th anniversary, I was living in uh, Los Angeles, uh, California. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find a Palestinian pastor, Palestinian Christian, and we're going to demonstrate what real peace can be, right? So it's a long story, but I found a pastor, Jamil Fakuri. He was the pastor of a Nazarene church in Pasadena, right? And, uh, and we, we, uh, I called him. He was interested in having like a service together. So I went over to his house. And we both had the same response. I can't believe that you exist, right? He could not believe there were Jewish believers in Jesus. I could not, there are Arab, Palestinian believers in Jesus. This was a long time ago. Today, I, I certainly know that, you know? Uh, and so uh, we had great conversation to try to understand each other and understand our people. And he was not against Jews, but there's a history on the ground, Right? He was raised in East Jerusalem, right? He came to the United States at some point. And, and we had this wonderful service where it was, you had uh, Iraqis and Syrians and Lebanese and Israelis and American Jews, and we were dancing and singing and had a wonderful, uh, just a wonderful time of worship and celebration. But one thing that, that he and I kind of figured out is that how do we relate to each other's peoples? How do we do this? Because there's a history here, you know? And so we kind of looked at it like, let's say we were next door neighbors and we're in our kitchen and we're looking out the kitchen window in the backyard and we see that our kids are in a fight. And so we run outside. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to run to our kid and say, are you okay? What's going on? And, you know, and, and, and all of that. It doesn't mean that we despise the other, but we have a particular connection to, you know, to, to, to the one. And so uh, I remember saying to him, Jamil, what is the answer? What is the answer? And he would always, he would always say, he said, come Lord Jesus. <laughs> it was, that was, a, you know, and that is the answer. That is the answer. And we need to propagate that answer. We have a heart for evangelism. We have a heart to bring the, the message of salvation to uh, the Jewish people. My son is a Jewish believer, uh, you know, a, a, a strong uh, a believer uh, living in Israel. He's been there for uh, almost 10 years, about nine and a half years. 
He served in the army. He works and lives in, in Israel. Uh, and in Israel, you are in the reserves, the active reserves. Here, they're about 45 years old. And so he's 32. Uh, and he's in for the duration. And, uh, you know, uh, my wife and I, uh, we believe that this, uh, it's a calling on his life for him to be in Israel. So he's where he's supposed to be. And the rest of it is in God's hands. But, but, you know, we don't like the destruction of anything. In fact, you'll notice in the Bible, when you read about the description of life after the, like the world to come, I know it talks about the healing, and I know it talks about vegetation in the land, but by and large, the main thing it talks about is no more war, no more conflict. In fact, it says, and they will not even learn war. Swords will be turned into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. They'll be doing farming. See, that's what that, you know. And, 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 and so we know that is the answer. But right now, in this in between, now and then, we're living in a dark world as believers. And it's hard to navigate as Christians this whole thing. And so we do our best with what's right and what's merciful. You know, what's right and what's merciful. You know, justice in the Bible is not revenge as we define it in the United States. Uh, It is just doing what's right and merciful. I don't know. You know, it's above my pay grade to know exactly what's right and merciful right now. Uh, But what I do know is, is that God will have his way. God will have his way. And we need to pray that way. Uh, uh, and we need to recognize that God's hand is still on Israel. Yes, God loves all peoples and all of that, but what everybody needs is the Messiah of Israel. And as, and as Christians, recognize that Christians are grafted in to that Jewish vine. And so there is a connection, whether we like it or not, regardless of anything, whether we like it or not. There is a connection between Christians and Jews. Uh, It is, uh, uh, you know, it is just the way it is. When we sing these songs, when we call uh, Jesus our king, he's the king of the Davidic kingdom, right? And we, we become part of that. And so we need to be able to frame these events in that way. How's that? (laughs) <laughs> so that's I, you know you didn't interrupt me uh, you could have you know said wait 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 what do you mean by that so my second question okay <laughs> right 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 uh, if we have more time I would take questions but we don't so we will we'll continue with the worship Rabbi thank you again we'll continue with our worship with our reflection and so I just want to Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Why don't we come again here? Please? Okay. That's a round of applause. Please join us in singing hymn 413, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
I've asked the rabbi to say the, the benediction. He will be here, so please feel free to come forward and greet him and to uh, just ask him any questions. Um, and again, Rabbi, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, friend. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, and I'm happy to stick around. You know, I do have a habit of talking too much. Okay, so I uh, please, I'm happy to answer any questions or whatever you'd like. And uh, of course, you know, when uh, the uh, Israelites uh, uh, left uh, uh, the uh, Mount Sinai area, uh, uh, God gave them um, a benediction. And so I'll, I'll pray that in Hebrew uh, and, uh, and in English. And may we all, may we all be protected and with the peace of God. Yivarecha ha Adonai ve Yishmarecha Yer Adonai panave lecha vichunecha Yisa Adonai panave lecha v'yisem lecha Shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you. Go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thank you, everyone, for being here.